In Psalm 50, just listen to me for an intro now. In Psalm 50, God is talking to his own people. Also, God is talking to the people who are living in wickedness. You know, usually when we read a psalm, the psalm is going to be either a song, a praise song, or most of the time it is going to be a prayer. So the, when you think about Psalm, the first thing comes in our mind is maybe just David or someone is praising God or somebody is praying to God or even at times the, the Psalms are used to declare the glory of God, whoever God is, what God you know, has done and what God can still do. So usually you know, Psalms are these kind of, you know, these kind of uh, you know, lyrics that we read as we read from the, from the scripture. But Psalm 50... It's a peculiar psalm. It is a psalm of reproof, or it is a psalm of admonition, or we can say it is a psalm of correction at times. So in the first section of the psalm, from verses 8 to 15, God is talking to his own people. Who are his own people? Israel, the people of Israel. And who are those Israel today? We are the Israel. So God is speaking to his own people in the first section convincing them to come out of all their tradition from all their foolish things that they are doing and God wants them to turn back to him but you know by doing all the traditional things they forgot to practice godliness in their lives so God wants to turn their hearts towards them in the second section God is going to speak to the wicked people of the world and we are not going to go there because we don't need that now so, but what we need is, we want to listen from God this morning, what God is telling to his own people, the children of Israel. So, I'm going to exegically or critically going to analyze the text as it appears on the screen. And I want you to follow with me, you know, follow me closely. So, let's read from Psalm 50, verse 8 onwards. Here the psalmist says, I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. You know, many gods of the world today demand sacrifice, don't they? Many gods of the world today demand sacrifice. And so did the Old Testament God. Who is the Old Testament God? Hello, church. Who is the Old Testament God? Jehovah, our God, the Father, he also demanded sacrifice. But our God is a peculiar God. Can you compare our God with some other God? Is he comparable? No, not at all. So our God is a peculiar God. So he is a unique God. The way he works is, he works in a unique way. So the way he expected sacrifice is different from the other gods demanding sacrifices. You can bring, think about all those gods and goddesses that you remember and the kind of sacrifice offered to those idols as people were standing before those gods and goddesses. But certainly even though our God demanded sacrifice, he is not such a God. He is a unique God. So verse 8, he says, I will not rebuke, God says to the children of Israel, I will not rebuke you for your offerings, sacrifices are your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. In other words, they were offering plenty of them to God. And God has no complaint about that. God says, they are all in front of me. The, all the offerings and sacrifices you give to me, they are all in front of me. I don't have any complaints about that. But then there is something is going wrong here. If you go to verse 9, God says, I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. I will not take... A bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. Think about it. I want you to think and follow me this morning. You need to be, you know, you need to be just thinking what God is trying to tell. And God is saying, I will not take a bull from your house. I will not take a goat from your fold. In other words, listen to me. God is saying, I'm sick of your offering. I don't have any complaints that, you know, you are, you are not giving offerings. No, 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 no. You are giving offerings. But I will not take any bull from your, I will not take any goat from your fold. I am sick of your offering. I don't want them anymore. 
Even though he commanded you to offer, I don't want your sacrifices, I don't want your offerings anymore. Verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine. Can you say that with me? God says, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle of a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. Who knows? God knows all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the fields are whose? God's. God says, it's all mine. And verse 12, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness is mine. You know, God is saying, everything belongs to me. Everything belongs to me. The forest is mine. The cattle on the mountain is mine. The birds on the mountain is mine. And the beasts of the field is mine. If I'm hungry, why should I tell you? Why should I wait for you to come to church and give the offering? I will not wait. I will not wait because it, everything belongs to me. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. So what do we understand from this scripture as we read it so far? What is the mistake the children of Israel were making? You know, probably today, as his one people, we may be making that mistake. They were thinking that all the sacrifices they were offering, they were thinking that God needed them. They thought... God needed all these bulls and animals that they are bringing to the temple of God. In other words, they were thinking that God is depending on them. Can you imagine that? Such a mighty God, such a powerful God, depending on people. You know, there is something wrong in their thinking. They were thinking that probably God needs, because they were comparing our God with the other gods. The other gods, when the offering is done, they want to eat the offering. Have you seen other gods? Yes? No, you're not seen? Where are you coming from? Which country? You never got a chance to see how they do the offerings to the other gods? They hold the animal and chop the head of the animal. The animal will just, you know, struggle for some time and it dies. They come and they bring the offering into the, in, 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 into the altar and they chop the offerings and then God comes in. I don't know how God comes, but most of the time God comes in the form of human because they are possessed. They come and eat the flesh the way they eat. A man cannot do that. Have you not seen that? No? Okay. So people in Israel, they were comparing our God with one of those gods and goddesses. But God is telling them, you don't need to give me anything. There's an important message this morning. You don't need to give me anything because I own everything. Is it true that God wants everything? How many of us believe that God wants everything? Yes, God wants everything. Verse 13, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God is telling that you are treating me as though I'm hungry to you eat the flesh of the bull. You are treating me as though I'm thirsty to eat, drink the blood of the goats. That's how you are treating me. You know, they were thinking that all the sacrifices they were bringing, God needed them because God is going to eat them and God is going to drink them. But God is saying, you offer me the sacrifice but you haven't understood what kind of God I am. What kind of God I am. I'm not the kind of gods or goddesses who drinks flesh and who eats blood. I'm not such a God. I'm not at all such a God. Even though there are many gods and goddesses, I am a unique God. Can you say unique God? You know, our God is a peculiar God. We are trying to understand the characteristics of our God, who our God is. And God wants to set them right in the following way. You know, that was the problem with the children of Israel. They bring all the sacrifices. They brought more than what God needed. And they thought, God needed all these sacrifices. But that's not true. That's not true. God did not eat anything. God did not drink anything because everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. So by nature, 
You know, we are such a people, we think that at times God needs our sacrifices and offering. And God is going to give an answer now. What he expects in verse 14. Offer to God. What? Offer to God. Thanksgiving. And pay your vows to the most high. What God expects? God expects a thanksgiving offering. And what may be that offering, the thanksgiving offering? It may be the words of our lips. Don't you say that, thank you Lord for what we do have done? At times we give the lip sacrifice, the thanksgiving through our lips. In the Old Testament it may be an animal sacrifice. They bring an animal as a thanksgiving offering and give to God and sacrifice the animal at the altar. And I believe more than everything, when God says offer to God thanksgiving, it's the attitude of our heart. Can you say attitude? It's an attitude of our heart. You know, God knows everything that's going, with, going on with, going within our side, within, inside of us. So God wants us to give thanksgiving offering to God. And God also wants us to pay the vows to the Most High. What is that vow? Some promises that we have taken. Yes? We all take some promises, right? Do you remember those promises that you have taken for God? Yes? Do we? Do we take promises? Yes, right? Lord, I need this. Please do it, Lord God. And I will be faithful to you. You know, sometimes even we, 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 we tell God, Lord, if you do that, Lord, I will take this portion of my income and pay it as an offering to you. We make vows. We make promises to God. And God is saying, offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. You know, here scripture is teaching us something. You know, by nature, we are the recipients of God's blessing. Can you say recipients? By nature, we always receive from God. Even when we give our sacrifices at the altar, we are still the recipients. We are still the recipients because we can never give to God. Because God has everything already. You can never give to God because everything that we see belongs to God. So even though we come to church, come to the temple of God with an offering, it's not that we are giving to God, but still we are receiving. Still we are receiving. So by nature we are recipients of the blessings of God. Can you you be alive without for, for a moment without receiving the blessing of God? No, we all need that blessing of God. Every moment, every time to walk, you know, every time to live, every time to breathe, you know, we need that blessing of God. We are recipients of God. But thanksgiving offering is not really to give to God, but it is a gratitude of receiving from God. You know, when we give to God with our heart, saying that, Lord, you have done so much in my life, Lord God, I just want to bless your name. Even though you think that you are giving to God, We are not really giving to God, but we are receiving. We are always the recipients of the blessings of God. So God doesn't need our our givings, but instead we need. We are the people we need to receive from God. Verse 15, God says, bring the offerings of thanksgiving and pay your vows. Call upon me. In the day of trouble. During the offering we read from Psalm 116. God said bring your offerings and call upon me. So here again God is saying bring your offerings of thanksgiving and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You know God wants us to call upon his name. God wants us to depend on him. It's good that we bring offerings and tithes and everything and to give to God. But God, more than everything, God wants us to depend on Him. God doesn't want really give us, give our offerings, our sacrifices to give to God as if, you know, He is just waiting for our offerings and sacrifices. No, He is not. But instead God is saying, call upon me in the day of trouble. Now, as I said, our God is a peculiar God. Our God is, he is asking us to give, but same time he doesn't want. Can you imagine? He is asking us to give, but same time he doesn't want. But the work of God needs. 
the work of god in the new testament the work of god needs all our giving and god is asking us to give that's also important so our god is a peculiar god our god is a jealous god have you come across that in your life our god is a jealous god if you love your child more than you love god god will prompt you have you come across not yet you will if you love your husband or your spouse more than god god will tell you sometime god touches love your children just more than god you pray for a child and when you are blessed with the child then you can you don't have time to serve god because you need to take care of the child i mean that's a normal cycle right we all go through right before childbirth we are all at the church and after childbirth we are busy same thing happens after marriage too you know before marriage we want to come to church regularly right every time right mithun so every time we come to church regularly we are very particular very punctual so once we get married what happened now mithun is a student he's just still studying right i just somehow my his name came okay anyway so so once we get married i am busy couple of people wanted to follow jesus and jesus said come follow me and what he said i just got married right it's just normal cycle that we go through all of us but god is a peculiar god he is a jealous god if god has seen you if god's eyes are upon you at some point of time in your life he is not going to leave you he is not going to leave you because he is a jealous god some of us sitting here you don't want to sit here today morning but you are sitting here why because he doesn't leave you he doesn't leave you he draws you to closer to god through somebody he does that you are brought into the presence of god because he is a jealous god our god is also a selfish god at times have you seen that the way he does things it looks like he's so selfish he doesn't give his glory to anybody he doesn't give he's so selfish you try to take the glory of god or oh, today i preach the great message you know everybody you know really praise me you try to take the glory of god on you no you'll get that you'll get really you'll get from god if your thought is that way you think that you know oh i give a great amount to god you know i'm just very good in offering my name is in the first in the list and you will know he's a very selfish god he wants to make sure all the glory not even a bit of it everything he wants to take it's a peculiar god you don't understand i don't understand at times he's a very peculiar god so this is what god is saying he wants us to call upon him and he wants us to you know receive the deliverance from him and then he wants to take the glory <laughs> can you imagine he wants to he puts us in trouble or we gets into trouble because forgetting god and he's he'll be waiting there he wants us to call upon him and once we call upon him and then he will deliver us for what for him to take the glory if you come out of the prison by yourself you'll say that i broke the iron rod and came out of the prison no god doesn't allow that he will wait until you call upon him until you call upon him before that nothing will happen So in the New Testament context according to Psalm 50 as with a couple of verses we read God is saying I don't need your money Of course the work of God needs is 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 needs our money but God is saying I'm not really depending on your money I will survive whether you give or not I don't need your money that means we don't give to God because he's asking instead we give to God with an attitude of thanksgiving with an attitude of honoring our god so god wants us to practice religion and rituals in sorry god not doesn't want us to practice and religion practice religion as and the rituals instead god is asking us to call upon him you know what in the old testament people forgot to call upon the name of the lord they thought going to the temple and bringing the sacrifice in the right time and offering those sacrifices to god is more than enough that's what they thought they never called upon the name of the lord but god is so so unhappy and he is telling the children of israel you need to call upon my name and that's what god wants us to do so god doesn't need 
our money. Can you say that with me? God doesn't need our money. So that's the title of my sermon this morning, even though I am in the middle of the sermon. God doesn't need our money. Let's go to Psalm 116 verses 12 and 14. Psalm 116 verse 12 says, What shall I render to the Lord? Psalm 116 verse 12, 13, 14. What shall I render to the Lord for all its benefits towards me? Can you say benefits? You know, in our workplaces, we are getting paid. For what? For what? For our work. Not really for using WhatsApp in your workplace, no. For the work we do. For the work we do, we are getting paid. Do you get only the pay or you get some benefits too? Some benefits too. Some health benefit, right? Some, some life uh, insurance, some stock, some share, everything. You get all the other benefits. So you, have, you are paid for your work and you get additional benefits and additional support and help from the organization. So here, the psalmist says, what shall I render to the Lord? Not for what you have done, for all his benefits. For all his benefits. God gives more than what we deserve. That's what it means. We deserve the $11 per hour. But God gives more benefits we don't deserve the life that we have in this nation but God gives those things as a benefit to us so God is always a giver God is always a giver verse 13 I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord Samus is saying Lord you give me everything what shall I render Lord for all the benefits you give what do we do I shall take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Cup of salvation. What does it mean? Cup of salvation. If you can imagine with me. On the day when you got saved. Do you remember when you got saved? Which year? Have you got saved? Yes. Yes. Are you sure you got saved? Somebody's mouth is. Are we sure we got saved? Yes. Yes. Can I say an S from everybody? Yes. Are you sure? First thing you need to jump out, you know, when somebody asks you, are you saved? Have you saved? Yes, I am saved. Are we happy about our salvation? Yes. 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 Okay. So we are all happy about our salvation, right? Because God saved us. So now he's talking about a cup of salvation. Have you received a cup on the day when you got saved? No? No? No. Imagine you got a cup on the day of salvation. Right? God has given you a cup. So you look into the cup. You see all the blessings that God has in store for you. Not only that. You all see all the sufferings that you are going to face. Once you get saved, what starts? Once you get saved, what starts? Life starts. Yeah, life starts. It's very clever. Okay, once you get saved, what starts? Struggles. Sorry? Struggles. Temptation starts. Struggles. Struggles starts. What else? Blessings. Yes, blessings. Blessings start. Temptation starts. Trouble starts. For some of them, persecution starts. Do you know that? The moment you get saved, what starts? Persecution starts. It's all there in the cup that God has given in your hands. It's not a strange thing. It's already there in the cup. You're not looking into that cup. Look into that cup. Jesus was holding that cup in his hand. Lord, if it is your will, take this cup away. I can't hold that anymore. And now the psalm is saying that take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. When do you take up the cup of salvation? When somebody is drinking, you know, when do they show the cup? Again. They want more. Can you say more? They want more. We take up the cup of salvation because certainly we need the blessings of God more for us, our survival. We need every moment. So we take up this cup of salvation and we call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, 
I need more of you, Lord. I need more blessings, Lord. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. We are again the recipients of God's blessings. Verse 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So whatever promises I made, I will pay everything. So these are the scriptures this morning I just want to keep in front of you. We are going to talk about three lessons before we close. Number one, lesson number one, what do we learn from all the scriptures? Number one, God doesn't need our money. Can you say that with me? God doesn't need our money. So our giving is important. The work of God needs our money, but God doesn't need our money. We should never think that God is surviving because of our giving. No, God doesn't need our money. Our giving tells that God is not depending on us, but we are depending on you. You know, that should be the attitude when we give to God. When we come with an offerings, not that we are giving, doing a favor to God, but instead, Lord, I still need from you. I still am depending on you. But this is my thanksgiving to you because you have done so much and your work has to happen on the face of this earth. I know there are missionaries. I know there are orphans. I know there are people who have never heard the gospel. I know that work of God has to be established on the face of this earth. I am thankful. But God doesn't need our money. If God needs money, think about the other way. He doesn't need to ask us. He can just take it. Right? He doesn't need to ask us. Ananias and Sapphira. I may not have time to go there. Read that from Acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 10. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Yes? They were asked to sell a portion of this, a land. So they sold that. And what did they do? They brought the entire money to, the, to, to Peter? No. They brought a portion of the money. And when they brought the portion of the money, when Peter asked, and they said, this is the full amount that with we got from the land, selling the land. And what happened? Peter said, you have conceived these things within your heart. You got deceived within your heart. You have not lied to men, but you lied to Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They sold that amount, sold that land, and brought the money as if they are bringing the whole amount to God, but they took a portion of it. Nothing wrong in keeping that portion for them. But they lied to the Holy Spirit that God conceived within their heart that idea of giving a portion to God and keeping the other parts separate. And it talks about many things being faithful in our givings. You know, when we give, what kind of attitude of our heart we have within us, that's important. You know, sometimes our giving is not a blessing. Have you come across that? We give to God. Listen to me. We give to God. We are very particular in our tithe. We are very regular in tithe our offerings. Still, we don't see blessings. Still, we don't see blessings. The only answer I have is, the attitude of our heart is important. Not only towards giving, but in everything. But in everything. Now I come across a couple of people, you know, someone said that, I don't receive any blessing from God because I'm willing to give God. I give more than tithe. I give more than tithe. But that particular individual is not speaking to his sister, her sister. For a couple of years, the bitterness. God looks at all of our attitudes. When we bring our tithes and offerings. With what attitude we give? Ananias and Sapphira, they were standing in front of God. But they were not there with the right attitude. They are with, there, they are with the wrong attitude. And God did not honor their giving. So lesson one. What is number one? God doesn't need our money. Right? Number two lesson. God says, offer to God thanksgiving. Can you say that with me? Offer to God. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving offering, as I said, it is not giving to God. It is our gratitude of receiving from God. We are not giving something to God. 
but we are thanking God by giving that offering for what we receive from God. When you talk about thanksgiving, you know, thanksgiving at times it is considered as an external thing. You know, sometimes in the worship we ask you, can you thank God? Can you praise God? We can you thank God? So we all end up in thanking God. It is good, but it doesn't stop there. Thanksgiving is not really an external thing, but it is a heart thing. Can you say heart? Heart thing? So thanksgiving is not just an external thing that we do, but it is really from our heart. How do I give thanks to God? And I was thinking about it. How do I give thanks to God? Not really by saying. Saying is one aspect. But not really by saying, but by doing. Can you say that with me? By doing. So how can we give thanks to God? By doing. What do we do? So thanksgiving is an attitude of the heart expressed in physical action. So what is thanksgiving? It is an attitude of our heart expressed in physical action. Right? So that's what is thanksgiving. Think about now. A sinful woman coming and falling at the feet of Jesus. Washing his feet with her tears and wiping his feet with her hair. And disciples were not comfortable. They're asking, Lord, what's going on here? And Jesus said, her sins were many. How many sins? Many sins. And I forgive. How many sins? All of them. And she is a woman with a heart of gratitude. We don't see her thanking God, but we see her doing. You know, thanksgiving is not just saying, but thanksgiving is doing. One of the ten lepers went back to Jesus. And he fell at the feet of God. And with a loud voice he glorified and gave thanks to God. One of the ten lepers that Jesus healed. Thanksgiving is not just a word, not just, not just a lip sacrifice alone, but thanksgiving is action. Thanksgiving is action. You know, when we want to give thanks to God, we are there to serve God. We are there to serve God. The way we can give thanks to God is by serving God. By working for God. You know, someone really helped us to bring us to this nation. When we came to this nation, someone was running day and night and, you know, trying to buy things and doing all these things and, you know, help us to settle down in this nation. And we want to be thankful. Do you really take the phone, mic, phone and just call them once in a while and say, thank you for what you have done and get the phone. And after a few days, again, take the phone. Thank you for what you have done. Do you, do you say that? No. If something happens in that house, you will run because you want to help. Because they helped you. Don't we? We want to help. Thanksgiving is not just saying. It's an attitude of heart expressed in our action. You know, when there is a tough job, especially in the ministry. Right? When we plan such certain things. Oh, come on, we'll, let's plan for the picnic. And we form the team and then we plan for the picnic. Someone says, no, 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 it's not easy to plan for the picnic. It's not easy to find a place for the picnic. I don't think we can get. You know, that's one attitude. But instead, somebody says, I will find a place. I will find who are the people, those who are going to come. Let's make it happen. Serving God in action. When there is a tough job, we see everybody falling apart. Have you come across that? When there is something which is really tough, that's not a heart of thanksgiving. Heart of thanksgiving is just being available when there is a need. And who is having the need? God is having the need of us serving him, of us serving to the poor, of us serving somebody. And how can you do that? Maybe by just coming and singing the praises of God. One way of doing. Playing an instrument, cleaning the church. I really honor those who clean the church. Cleaning the church. Many different ways we can serve God. Many different ways we can serve God. There are many things. Our attitude must be always yes when it comes to the work of God. Never say no. Never say no. You know, I have seen in my life people backing. 
when it comes to the matter of working and doing something for God, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. No, we are not expecting somebody to appreciate us. We are not expecting somebody to praise us when we do some great things. But we want to do it for God, whether somebody recognizes us or not. We want to do certain things for God. Do not wait for you know, somebody to come tap your shoulder and tell, come on, you did a great job. Do not wait for that. Don't expect that. If you receive that, you receive the reward on the earth. That's what Jesus said. Just wait for nobody saying anything to you. But you keep doing, you keep doing. Shall we ask God for that kind of attitude? Heart of thanksgiving. Let's move for the lesson three. Jesus says, here God says, I don't want your money. And God says, offer to God thanksgiving. And now lesson three, this is a very important lesson today. God says, call upon me. Call upon me. You know, God wants us to call upon him in the day of trouble. Can you say day of trouble? Then he will deliver us and then we will glorify him. You know, what a God he is. He wants us to call upon him in the day of trouble. And then he will, you know, deliver. And then he will take the glory. Such a great God. You know, even when everything is going well, listen to this very important. When everything is going on well, God wants us to depend on him. Even when everything is going on well. God wants us to depend on him. We have enough money. We have enough comfort. Family is doing good. Children are doing good. Workplace is good. Church is good. Everything is perfect. God wants us to depend on him. How much time it takes for us to lose our health? Just a fraction of a second. God wants us to depend on him. And when we think that, this is, this is important now, when we think that we can achieve by our own strength, you know, that's a human nature. When we have everything, we think that we can achieve by ourselves. Do you think that way? I think that way. What about you? Yes? When we have everything, we think that we can do it. But when we think that way, we fail. Do we fail? Yes. When we think that we can do everything by our strength, we fail. And then what we do? Then we will come to, start coming to church. Show up on a first time in the Sunday morning. Right? We think he's the first time visitor, but not. He's not a first time visitor. He's been there with us, but then he's missing for three months. Right? So, then we'll come to church. Because now we need God. Now we need God. Why? Because I tried with my strength. I failed. Now I realized I need God. And God says, call upon me. Still hear the same voice that we heard three years back. Call upon me. That time it was for your visa, but now it's for your baby. That time it was for your visa to come to Canada, but now it's for your job or your marriage. Same voice. Call upon me. Call upon me. Then God will deliver and then we will glorify God. And this cycle repeats the entire life. I want you to think about that. This cycle repeats the entire life. May it, may it be in your studies, may it be in your health, may it be in your family situation, may it be concerning your children. God wants us to depend on him every time you know he just makes such a great dependency he makes such a great dependency you know that this sounds so silly actually but our god is such a god our god is such a god he makes somehow me make sure that you depend on god for every move in your life and moment you leave him moment you try to do things by your strength you will fail again come back into the same cycle call upon me i will deliver and you will glorify my name Lazarus died. Jesus allowed Mary and Martha to cry for four long days. Cry, cry until you lose all your strength. Cry. They cried. They cried. Jesus delayed and came after four days. For what? For what? To take glory. Not only in Bethany. But during through the entire world, he wants to take glory. Four, day, four days he delayed 
and he came and today we speak about him we speak about the power of god to resurrect somebody from the dead why for him to take the glory for him to take the glory every move in your life everything that you are going through today who wants to take the glory god wants to take it. now i want to think about your problem that the problem that you are in today when jesus saw the blonde blind the disciple asked him whether it is his sin or his parents sin that he is born blind that's what the question jesus said neither this man nor his parents sinned but the work of god should be revealed in him in other words he is born blind for the glory of god what you are going through today you are going through for what for the glory of god and you need to have the boldness to say lord what i am going through in my health what i am going through in my family what i am going through among my children all that today what i am going through lord it's for your glory and if we don't have that understanding today god really cannot help god really cannot help and god takes the glory but he doesn't take the glory in our weaknesses get me right he doesn't take glory in our weaknesses but he takes the glory when he removes that weakness out of you you know that's where god is taking the glory the baby david was sick when she, when he was born he couldn't breathe nothing the liver was not functioning at all but god was not glorified we were mourning we were crying we were praying and we were doing all these things but when god gets that glory when god takes the glory when the baby is surviving today when the baby is able to breathe today you know everything that is coming happening in your life is going to bring glory to god a child of god should understand this very clearly we are about to close now for that to happen god wants us to call upon his name to summarize god does need our money we are the receiver always receivers always offering to god thanksgiving our heart attitude is expressed in the form of action by serving god number 3 call upon him because god wants us to depend on him for everything shall we all stand for a moment